Chapter 11, Wednesday, November 27th, 1985. We push the door to the family video and go in. It pings, and Robin looks up from behind the counter. Henderson, she announces, lifting her hands in, in, in imitation of Steve's usual greeting to Dustin. Then she angles her head toward the back and calls, Harrington, your children. She stops to eye us. Your teenagers are here. Family video has changed a bit since since Starcorp. Looks a bit looks like looks like it took them all to remind them the people in Hawkins still like cool stuff after all. So they're gone ahead and expanded the main area. It's no longer just rows upon rows of shelves stacked with VHS cassettes. Now there's a spot with seats where folks can order food from the counter and just hang out. Salted popcorn and a Slurpee seems to be the most common combo, judging by the crumbs everywhere. Summer of 69 filters across the store from a stereo nearby, playing so low that I can barely, barely hear it. A few people sit at the table and play the free board games scattered around the shelves. There's a movie on, too, muted as it, as it plays on all the TVs stacked around. Always an old one we've seen a million times. Today, it's fo Footloose. From the expressions on people's faces, they're likely watching it for the first time. Amateurs. Hey, it's Scoop's troop. Steve Harrington emerges from the back. He and Dustin clap each, other, each other's shoulders. He attempts to do the same to Mike, but Mike inches away. You know, the Scoop's troop. Was just you guys and my sister, right? I say, that's not us. Saviors of Starcourt, then. What are you calling yourselves these days? Oh, oh, I know this one, says Robin, jumping over the counter and sitting across it. The party, right? She tilts her head. Kind of Orwellian, now that I think of it. Dark, even for you nerd types. We don't call ourselves anything, Mike says. Yeah, we haven't been a party in a long time, says Destin. Thanks to some people. And if you haven't already, please give me a like so this chapter gets picked up by the YouTube algorithm. Don't start, I say. You guys are the ones who never come out. Mike shakes his head. I'm going to go set up a board game while we wait for Max, he says, walking up to the shelves. What's wrong with him? asks Steve. The usual, says Destin. LDL. What? Long distance longing, says Destin. Not to, be sp not to be mistaken for LDL, Long Distance Love, which, which Susie and you have, we all chorus. Yeah, 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 whatever. Dustin gets peeved whenever anyone reminds him of how much he brags about Susie. I'm going to find my own movies. You guys have the new, you guys have the new Star Wars, right? And the new Conan? That's a negative on Star, War Star Wars, Henderson, says Steve. Keith's order went in late, so we're still waiting on the delivery. He points towards the horror shelves. You guys can check out Conan the Destroyer over there. Destin walks off triumphantly. I'm left alone with Steve and Robin. Steve eyes my basketball, then without warning slaps it, onto, slaps it out of my hands. It bounces, and he catches it feigning a dribble or two. Gah! I miss the old days, he says, tossing the ball from one hand from hand to hand. Say, Sinclair, want to hit a one and one on one in the parking lot? I look from the ball, I look from the ball to Steve Harrington. Absolutely the hell not. I may be trying out for the team, but I'm not stupid. He may have graduated, but I also remember exactly who Steve was as a varsity player. Asshole to a hundred percent. I'm good, thanks, I say. Your loss, he says, then dribbles out the door. Harrington, calls Robin. Your shift isn't over. So cover me, he calls back, then is out. Robin shakes her head. What adult. Then she looks to me. Anything I can help you with, Lucas? Anything in particular? I shoot a, I shoot a quick glance at my friends. Dustin is still over by the shelves, and Mike is selecting a board game from the racks. Not now, I say. Give her a quick pointed stare. I'll come back. When they're gone, I angle my head toward my friends. She chuckles. You know you can just tell them, right? She says. I look at my friends. 
Yes, but they're not ready, I say. Or maybe you aren't ready, she counters. The door opens. I look back to see if, it, if it's Max, but instead something hits me in the shoulder, drops to the ground, and rolls away. My basketball. The thrower, Steve Harrington, is sweating. Look sharp, Sinclair, he says, panting. You're going to flunk tryouts with reflexes like that. I pick up my ball and stuff it in my backpack, then join Mike and Dustin at the table. Mike has dumped one of his new Trivial Pursuit card games and started to lay it out. We've played this game at least once each time we've hit family video since the summer. It's the only thing we play together, now that we don't do D&D campaigns in Mike's basement anymore. Dustin arrives, holding two VHS tapes. Oh, you're going to love this, he says. Conan the Destroyer. But also, guess what I found out? The new kids. Ha, look here. From the director of Friday the 13th. He glances at me. I bet they'll cheer... I bet these will cheer Max right up. I have my doubts, but I'll just let them start the game. We begin, we begin playing, and soon we're engrossed, so engrossed that we've forgotten why we're here. The game takes an hour and 30 minutes, and we completely lose track of time. Only after we hear someone honking furiously in the parking lot. Nancy, back to pick us up. Does it dawn on us that Max never showed up? Mike and Dustin leave with two films Dustin selected, and I let them, and I let them because I can't argue for Max if she's not here. I promise to see them at movie night. Nancy wants to know if I'm riding back with them, but after a moment's thought, I tell them I'd rather walk to her house. She's not convinced, but I insist, so she leaves me in the parking lot. I I, I make sure that they've gone before I turn around and head back into family video. Chapter 12 Chapter 12, Wednesday, November 27th, 1985 Back in family video, my eyes dart around, checking to make sure no one with a chance of recognizing me and reporting back to my friends is around. Steve Harrington sits at the front desk. His brow furrows when he clocks me. Forget something? No. I look behind him. Where's Robin? His confused expression turns inquisitive. What'd you need Robin for? I feel the urge to tell him off like Dustin often does, to say, none of your, none of your business. But Steve and I don't have that kind of relationship. Also, I'm not built to be that kind of rude. Luckily, Robin emerges from the back room and saves me the trouble. Out of my way, Harrington, she says. Let those who know movies talk to movies. Steve rolls his eyes, shakes his head, and walks away. Robin watches him for a while, making sure he's not looking our way or paying attention. I quickly retrieve the VHS tape. I'm here to return. That championship feeling, 1983 NBA playoffs and finals, and slip it across to her. She receives it, but doesn't drop it in the box marked returns. Instead, she tucks it into a private bag. You know, she says, if you ever need any help talking to talking this out with your friends. No thanks, I got it. Do you really? She angles her head. Doesn't look like it from where I'm standing. She leans forward. Listen, Lucas, I know high school's a big change and every little thing can, can feel like a big deal. Like your whole life is always about to fall apart. But believe me, your whole life will, will be just fine, even if it doesn't feel like it will. She's not wrong. Mike and Dustin have been upset with me for so long and me back at them. Then Will and Elle returning for one day brought us all back together. And suddenly everything was forgiven, like we hadn't spent weeks avoiding each other. Even Max and I, who hadn't spoken in a while, were excited to be hanging out for the first time in forever. But now they're gone, and things have settled back into their old place. Not completely, though. We may be back to being friends, but they still raise eyebrows at me splitting out, splitting our usual hangout times to practice basketball with Jay. Some parts of me thinks they may be jealous, but I can't really blame them. I'd be jealous if they were jocks, which is why I'm keeping this from them. I'm not sure that they're ready to know just yet the reason I often have to bail right after school and miss one of their Super Mario Brothers sessions 
is because I'm watching basketball tapes. Jay recommended. I'm not ready for them to be upset with me again so soon. It's been tough, I say. Want to talk about it? I look up at Robin. I haven't spent any significant amount of time with her. But from the little I have, she seems like the one of the smartest people I know. Maybe not grades type smart, but I see her reading all the time. Sounds like me. Both at school and, and here at the corner. If she was um, a few years younger, she would fit into our party easy. I'm not surprised that she sees right through my non-answers. In fact, rather than wait for an answer, she motions me over to an empty table. We sit facing each other. I only just now realize how many freckles she has, which is like a bazillion. I put out the small notebook where I, I jot things down. It was a present from dad one Christmas that had always um, lain there unused until now. Seems like a good place to lay out my plans for the year in writing, among other things, like lessons from basketball practice with Jay and notes from the tapes. Also, plans to do stuff with Max once things get better between us. Ooh, a diary, Robin says, motioning up the spiral binding and small pen attached to the, to the flap. Look at you all fancy. What? No, 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 no. It's not a diary, just some short notes I like to keep. Look, I show her my guide to surviving freshman year. Unsurprisingly, she stops to study my notes with interest. Ah, she says, I know why there's, uh, there's, there's trouble in paradise. I look to see if she's kidding around, but she, but she has her face scrunched up in a genuine concern. What is it? She jabs a finger at the second line I've marked as completed. See where you get? See where you where you say, get out of a comfort zone and try new things? That's great on its own. But then remember, you are also someone else's comfort zone. So when you start making new friends and trying new things, it clicks. They start to feel jealous. Well, I wouldn't say jealous. More like their own comfort is threatened, you know. That's an expedited side effect of change. Every new thing you try takes the place of one that used to be there before. And when that's replaced, and when that's replaced is something you share with your friends you've known your whole life. It can feel like a betrayal. But the way they're feeling, the way you are feeling are both completely normal. She clicks her tongue. You'll all get over it eventually. Like when? She shrugs. Long as it takes. All change takes uh, takes some time, some adjusting to. I consider this for a beat. I consider this for a beat. It makes sense that Mike and Dustin don't hate basketball. But hate that it takes me away from them. Which is weird since they're the ones who barely want to hang out these days. But they're so slowly starting to, to get over it, which I think, as Robin says, will get better over time. But none of this explains Max's reaction to my choices. And I tell Robin this. At the mention of Max, her eyebrows go up. Oh, that's a very different game there, Lucas. Why? Because she's my girlfriend? Especially because she snaps her fingers. Here's a little test for you. Who's, who's the cause of the trouble you guys are having? You or her? I think on it. Kind of kind of us both. Her, really, but... Ah, uh, Robin makes a buzzer sound, then, then shakes her head softly. See? That's your first mistake in girlfriend land. There's never a problem that's just one... That, there's never a problem that's just one person's alone. Her problem is your problem, which means it's... It's a you both problem, and us and us problem. I've tried everything, I say. I don't think there's more I can do at this point to get her to open up to me, or even to make her feel better. Then maybe it's not about her opening up to you, or you making her feel better. Maybe it's just about you being there. Have you tried being there, Lucas? I squint. I don't know. I don't know what that means or how I can be there if I'm not trying to help. Robin leans forward. Why don't you why don't you start 
by just being there, like physically. Sit next to her and listen. Like, really listen. Don't speak. Don't try to solve anything. Just listen to what her silence is telling you. Just sit and listen. It's the opposite of everything I am. One of my best skills is literally solving problems. I'm not sure how my relationship can be solved by me simply doing nothing. But I don't want to sound ungrateful, so I tell Robin I'll think about it. And don't sweat and don't sweat all the other stuff. I see I see you wrote avoid relationships and friendship drama. And I think that's great because you really don't want to want that don't, you don't want that to overshadow all the good times you can have, you know. Like, remember to live in the moment. She taps at my book. You should add that to your list. After all, you only get to be in high school once. Don't spend your time putting out fires when you can enjoy the scenery. She points both thumbs at herself. And if you ever need someone to bounce ideas off of, sure, I say, adding the new rule, as she suggested. Let's hope, let's hope I don't have to take you up on that. With that, she returns to the counter. I am almost out the door when she calls when she calls back to me. Forget to tell you, she says, we have the new one. Want, want me to bring to ring that what are the sorry you guys. Forget to forgot to tell you, she says, we have the new one. Want me to ring that up right now? I glance around just like earlier, then say, sure. She pulls the new tape out of the same private bag from before and slips it to me. I don't need to look at the full title to know it's the right one. Pride and Passion, 1984 NBA Playoffs and Finals. Thanks, Robin, I say. I owe you. Don't sweat it, she says, then leans forward. But if you really want some peace of mind, I'd say it's generally easier to be honest with friends. It's weird to hear this from her, because insisting that other people always tell the truth used to be my stock and trade. To hear it directed at me is slightly uncomfortable. Okay, I say, then not at the computer on the desk, but until then, no records as usual, right? She gives me a thumbs up. You got it. Chapter 13. All right, you guys, I'll read that very soon. Chapter 13. Click on the link. And also, uh, if you haven't done so, please smash that like button. I'd appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening. See you in the next recording.